Well, good morning and welcome to our uh, service of worship with uh, Holy Communion. Um, this is the sixth Sunday that we have been not able to worship together um, in our parish churches. Uh, so welcome uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ from St. Michael's here in Lindhurst, give you a wave. And uh, from Christchurch in Emory Down, we'll give you a wave too. And for those folk uh, at All Saints in Minstead, uh, we'll give you a wave too. And we're aware that um, as we were reading our newsletter when it was sent yesterday, that over two and a half thousand people have shared in our broadcast since uh, we began over six weeks ago. That's really quite amazing. And thank you for all those who've been involved um, in that. Uh, just a couple of uh, notices for you. Um, you should have received, uh, I don't know if you can see this, put it there for you, you should have received our sixth uh, Together News, um, which absolutely looks fantastic. That's because Kate has done it and I haven't. Um, so thank you, Kate, for um, really improving um, the, the newsletter. Uh, it has got the hymns for today service uh, in this, so you might want to um, lay your hands on one of those. Um, uh, probably you've got it online, so um, you may need to open up your computer or something uh, to do that. But the words of all of our hymns this morning uh, are on here. It tells you also about what we're doing for this uh, coming week, and uh, much the same this evening, um, music for reflection, uh, an hour of hymns and worship songs. And then next Thursday, after we've all clapped uh, for our carers, um, we have Teze in the garden again, um, here at 8.30. And then on Friday evening, um, prayers and reflective worship. I encourage you to um, either email me or text me your prayers, things that you'd like us to remember, people, places, uh, things that are on your heart. Please send them to us and we will mix those prayers up with some worship songs. But I need your prayers by 12 noon on Friday, please, if possible. And then during this coming week, the, the daily priest um, in a pandemic uh, uh, reflections, um, the hymns, or rather the songs that we're going to be using this week, are all the songs that we are learning, the new songs we're learning for uh, Mickey's House and Fun Day Sunday. Um, so these songs, if you come to those services, may be familiar, um, but these are the ones that have been written specifically for those services. Um, so encourage the children, if you will, um, to listen to those songs um, and to sing along. Um, every um, you get to see Denzel, he should be here this morning, he's absconded somewhere, uh, if Clary hasn't taken him. Um, but uh, you get to meet Denzel, and that's a, a great opportunity. Every child in the school has access to this um, act of worship. This is a collective worship on Wednesday and Friday. Um, again, next Sunday, um, we meet again for um, our service of worship and Holy Communion. Now, two new things for you. Um, we're looking ahead now to not this coming week, but the following week. On Tuesday the 5th of May, um, using Zoom, I suspect, or something similar, we'll let you know next week in the newsletter, uh, we're going to be encouraging an open kind of discussion and coffee, um, just talking about um, imagining what perhaps church will look like uh, when we're able to meet again. Um, more information in next week's newsletter, but that's uh, the 5th of May at 10.30. And um, praying together is very important, so next week... Um, on the 7th of May, that's not this week, it's the following week, um, we'll start our still prayer meetings again um, using Zoom or something similar at 9.30, information for you next week. And also next week uh, you will receive with the newsletter um, a prayer diary. Um, we've worked hard to try and encompass much of our life together as church and as community and as nation and uh, we've put these things into a daily prayer diary to encourage you to pray. Now these are not uh, names of people in our churches. These are all events and situations at this time. So um, I hope you value the newsletter. Um, you should have a copy of it. Uh, if you haven't, um, then please get in touch with Kate uh, and she will um, uh, let you have a copy. Suzanne actually um, sends them out. So contact the Benefits Office. Um, whilst we're not working in the office, the Benefits uh, phone is still working and you can leave messages and Kate and Suzanne um, will pick them up. So thanks to Kate um, for producing it, and thanks to Suzanne um, for getting it out. And uh, as I say, I hope you've, uh, you've got that. So um, that's that. And then um, on the breakfast table this morning, I found one of these. Let me show you. You might recognize it. There you are, it's a 10 pound note. Um, 
And I only share that with you because one of the things that we're not able to do during our worship is to receive your offering. Um, there is great information in this newsletter about how you can give um, while we are not able to gather together and take up your offering. And my friends, let me encourage you, it is important that we carry on giving. Um, the work of the church continues and uh, the bills are still coming in. And so please, if you're able, um, look at the newsletter and look at ways that you can give. Even if you've just got a mobile phone, you can give um, to each of the parish churches using your mobile phone. But all the information is there for you. If you're in any doubt at all, then either contact your church warden uh, or your church treasurer. Okay, so that's all that to one side. Welcome to, obviously this is Anne, uh, my wife. Uh, this is Anne's mum. And this is with us um, in the vicarage uh, at this time. So we are gathered today. And as we come to uh, share Holy Communion, um, there are five, one, two, three, four, five wafers on uh, the pattern this morning um, and one of those I will take um, for all of you as an act of fellowship. Uh, so as we celebrate communion this morning um, I pray that uh, Christ would reveal himself to you with as much joy in the end as he did to Cleopas and his friend on the road to Emmaus. The order of service we're using is perhaps um, much more of a, a conversation than we would be used to. It's not just me reading the words, but we will share in our uh, responses. And uh, it might be helpful, perhaps it will be helpful, Kate, if you're listening, I'm sure you are, if we would include uh, this order of service, perhaps um, we get it out, um, and Suzanne maybe get it out as a separate email so people can print it off um, and share with us more fully. Well, let's just be still for a moment um, as we begin our worship together this morning. Welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace, mercy and peace be with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Welcome then to our service of worship, wherever you are uh, joining us from this morning. Uh, we pray that our worship will be a means of blessing. You know, we find in that uh, account of the uh, two men who encountered Christ on the road to Emmaus, that first of all, they stood still in the road with sad hearts. But by the time they got back to Jerusalem, we told that their hearts were burning uh, within them. And we pray that during this a time, a confusing time and distressing time for many, a very strange time for all of us, that we would be not like those disciples who are found with sad hearts this morning, but that God by his spirit would set our hearts on fire with love for him. We sing then our first hymn this morning, which is, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder.
Wow, what a great way to start our worship this morning. It was those two <clears throat> disciples of Jesus who were led home, as it were, not to Emmaus, but back to Jerusalem. And what joy filled their heart. More of that a little later. We worship this morning with Christians near and far, living, departed, old and young. Those with their families and those in isolation on their own. My friends, God word, God's word is for all of us. May, May it be, be a lamp to our, our feet. feet. And, and a light to our path. And so we pray, Lord, speak to us, that, that we, we may hear your word. Move among us, that, that we, we may behold your glory. Receive our prayers, that, that we, we may learn, learn to, to trust, trust you. you. Amen. Amen. We have the words of the Collect for today, the third Sunday of Easter. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 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 We have our Gospel reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about ten kilometres from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognise him. Jesus said to them, What are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still, with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days? What things? he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to let, set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. Near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, and they, said, and they held him back, saying, Stay with us, 
the day is almost over and it's getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven disciples gathered together with the others and saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. The two then explained to them what had happened on the road and how they had recognised the Lord when he broke the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who has promised to be with us even to the ends of the age. Amen. Now, we are um, not together this morning, um, and the Bibles are not to hand as they normally are in the church. Um, I encourage you, um, if you haven't got a Bible with you this morning, um, to bring a Bible to these services with you at home. Um, you know, we are a, a believing church, it's true, but we're also a Bible-believing church. And interesting in our reading this morning, how central to um, Christ's conversation and revelation of himself um, was his explanation from the scriptures showing how Christ was in the Old Testament from all the prophets, from Moses, there in Genesis, all the way through, um, even to John the Baptist, all the prophets, everything that's recorded of the prophets um, was, about, was about him. So um, if you have your Bibles with you, um, look at Luke chapter uh, 24, which is um, where um, I read to us from uh, this morning. But before we go there, you needn't turn to it, I want to just take you back to uh, Luke chapter 10. Remember, uh, there was an occasion after Jesus had chose the 12, sometime after choosing the 12 disciples, he chooses another 72. And he sends these 72 out, two by two, uh, so that's 36, my, if my maths is correct, 36 pairs of two. He sends them ahead of him to go into every town or every place he was going to, to make preparation for his visit. And Jesus says that in the light of the great harvest, more are needed to herald the gospel. But he sends out these 72 to herald the gospel. Almost an advanced party, if you like, visiting towns and villages and making preparation for his arrival. Now, this is what their preparation looked like. Luke tells us in great detail. There were three priorities that they had to give themselves to. The first one was that they were to encourage hospitality. You remember that uh, Jesus said to them, if they're not welcome in a particular home, then they're to shake the dust off their shoes and leave. But they were to encourage hospitality. Secondly, they were to be involved in healing the sick in every town. And they were to say to the people, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Those three priorities. Now, they were important priorities, not just in preparing the way, but they had a ministry in their own right. So let's flip over now to the Gospel reading we had in Luke chapter 24. It's generally agreed there in verse 13, when we read of these two followers of Jesus, that they were two of the 72 chosen by Jesus. They'd worked together during his ministry. It's possible that they were related, maybe even brothers. But here they are on the road to Emmaus, on their way home. That's where they came from. But here are two of Jesus' followers whose ministry, I reminded you, is to encourage hospitality, to heal the sick, and to preach the kingdom of God. So it was pretty full on for them. They were part of Christ's, if you like, inner circle of friends. And they saw so much more than is recorded in the Gospels. And they knew Christ intimately. Now, I don't know how easily discouraged you are when something doesn't turn up or turn out as you expected, 
I find myself getting more and more kind of frustrated when things don't arrive when they're supposed to, because basically I probably got less things to be worried about. So my hope is that 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 I've ordered is going to arrive. When it doesn't, I feel discouraged. We discourage often when the news is not what we hoped it would be. Or the decision that is made is not a decision that we expected. We can be disappointed if people don't act as we expect. And actually, I think this is true also. We can dis be disappointed in ourselves when we fail to do what we believe we should. We don't often express that disappointment, but deep in our very souls, we can often feel it. Now, what's interesting is that in our disappointment, we can often get involved in discussions in which we tell others what we believe should have happened. And we debate the failure of others and let everyone know whose fault it was and where the responsibility lies. That's the kind of discussions that we get involved in when we are discouraged. We don't just say something didn't happen, but we begin straight away to tell others whose fault it was and what we think should have happened and who should have done better. And the discussion can sometimes turn into a debate. And the debate can become disagreement. And the appraisal of the facts, as you believe them to be, can easily deteriorate into an argument. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's because um, the thrust of the Greek here in this passage in, in Luke 23, remember, uh, they were talking and discussing. Not just talking, not discussing. But it's a way in the Greek of saying they were arguing. There was kind of energy. There was disagreement. This was not a, a gentle discussion strolling through the countryside. It was a full-on argument as they were comparing their understanding of what had happened in the days previously past. They were talking and discussing. They were arguing. They were having what we sometimes call a full and frank exchange of views about how they each remembered and understood the facts about what had happened. The betrayal, the trial, the execution and the death of Jesus. And the passage that Luke gives us here leads us to believe that their interest only was in declaring, discussing the facts one to another. And that's my point this morning. That belief in the facts alone of Jesus' betrayal, trial, execution and death is not going to bring you or I joy. It really isn't. As we often sit and debate the facts, joy leaves us and we become despondent. You know, across the ages, as theologians, churches and individual Christians have debated fact, theological fact, these discussions and debates over theology, you know, what we believe and how we should behave in the church has resulted, hasn't it, in fracture, division and distrust, which still um, is present in our churches today. Now, as I see it, the reason that Jesus walks with these two, as we read here in this passage, two that he personally chose um, a couple of years previously, possibly, to be followers and disciples of his, was to demonstrate to them and to us that if our hearts are to burn within us, it will not be because we can expound profound facts about Jesus, but it will be because we experience personal faith in him. Now in this coronavirus pandemic, I want to suggest that our ability as church to explain the facts about the events leading up to and including the death of Jesus will be of no comfort and no help or relevance to any, even ourselves for that matter, if this is not accompanied by an explanation and the experience of personal faith. In verse 17, Jesus says to these two disciples, uh, let me read it to you. What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, Are you the only visitor Jerusalem, to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? They were discussing the things that had happened. They were interested in events, in the facts. What happened when? Where? And Jesus says, What are you arguing about? 
and they stood still with sad faces. And that's where argument about fact very often will get us, even as we discuss theology and theological, theological fact. And bit by bit, Cleopas and his friend reveal the events of the past few days, fact after fact after fact, telling this stranger. And can you imagine later on how they would have kicked themselves when they said to him, but are you the only one? who doesn't know what happened in Jerusalem. If only they knew who they were talking to. If anybody knew what happened in Jerusalem, it was the one who was talking to them. It was Jesus as he revealed himself later on. Now let's for a minute just go back to Luke chapter 10, um, when uh, Cleopas and his friend um, uh, were uh, from Emmaus, we believe, and were handpicked by Jesus to encourage hospitality, to heal the sick and to preach the kingdom. They had themselves, we have to believe, enjoyed eating and relaxing with Jesus as part of his inner circle of friends. They had themselves witnessed the healing of the sick. And I would suggest from what we're told in Luke 10, had themselves been instrumental in a healing ministry. And they had preached confidently that the kingdom of God is near. Amazing, having done all of that, we find them here stood still on the road with sad faces. And Cleopas then asks this stranger, are you the only one who doesn't know these facts, the things that have been happening over these last few days? And after fact, after fact, after fact, they spread out to Jesus everything that had happened that they had witnessed. But you know, these facts clearly were no comfort to them. Just as facts in a crisis will be little comfort to us. Perhaps this morning you are sat or standing with sad faces. Perhaps you're disappointed that the facts that you believe in are little comfort to you and you're sad. The facts that you believe and are recited by the church week after week are somehow insufficient to sustain you, to keep hope alive and faith strong. Well then listen, my friends, Jesus says, with the greatest of respect, how foolish are you? How slow to believe everything the prophet said. Not just that Jesus would enter the world, born of a virgin, would begin his ministry in Galilee, would heal the sick, raise the dead, would be criticised even by his own neighbourhood, would be betrayed, tried and crucified and buried. Fact after fact after fact, yes. But the prophets from Moses to John the Baptist tell us not just what Jesus would do, but who he was. And it is my conviction that these two disciples on the road to Emmaus were discussing what Jesus did, what happened to Jesus, not who he was and what Jesus had accomplished for them. So that beginning in the possession of facts should lead to a profession of faith. If it doesn't, then it's understandable that you're going to be stood with sad faces. By explaining all the facts, and you can have all the knowledge in your head that you want, and more, by explaining all the facts is of no benefit to you or to anybody else unless these facts lead you to a personal experience of faith. Now, I am of a certain age, and I guess those around the table, and maybe you are of a certain age, who know what Gaviscon is. Adverts for Gaviscon on our television believe that heartburn is unpleasant, unwelcome, and unnecessary. Because Gaviscon, see those firemen with their hoses pouring it all out? <laughs> but the heartburn that Cleopas and his friend experience there in verse 30, as Jesus breaks bread and blesses them, is not unpleasant but pleasant, is not unwelcome but is most welcome, and is not unnecessary, is especially necessary. And my prayer for the church, for you and for I at this time, is that we might individually and together as church have a good dose of heartburn. 
as these disciples realize it is revealed to them who Jesus was. What is it that they said? Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? A good dose of heartburn as the revelation of Jesus Christ to us is received in our hearts. As the revelation of Christ takes us right back to where the action happened. Yes, with the disciples, we declare Jesus is risen. But will you notice that they declare Jesus is risen indeed? And that's very important. There are many people around us that will believe in the fact that Jesus has risen, yes. But when we say Jesus has risen indeed, we're recognising that there is a personal engagement. We, indeed he is risen. He is risen for me. That's what they're saying. He is risen for us. Something more than the fact. Indeed, he is risen for us. Not merely as fact, but as the most glorious statement of faith. So what are the facts, quickly? Well, the facts are that Jesus was born, according to scriptures, of a virgin. That's the fact. But when we say, yes, he was born indeed, we say, yes, he was born for me. The fact is that Jesus lived a sinless life, but that's not enough. We must believe, our faith is, that Jesus lived a sinful life for us. We believe that Jesus healed the sick. Yes, fact, he raised the dead. But the compassion, authority and power that he demonstrated, faith says, he demonstrates for us too. The fact is that he died, that he was crucified between two criminals outside the city walls. But faith says he died for me. The fact is that he rose again from the dead. But the fact, that's the fact. Faith says he rose from the dead. He conquered sin and death for me. The fact is that he appeared to his disciples on the one occasion to more than 500 at a time. That's the fact. But faith says he has appeared to me. So they're tired and they go back to their home in Emmaus and they invite Jesus to rest for the night. And then he does something which just drives home the reality of who he was. He takes bread he breaks it, he takes the wine, he blesses it. And at that moment, they see who he is. It's at that moment, even with the Apostle Paul, that the scales fall from their eyes. They see him, not as fact, but by faith they embrace him. He is risen, yes, but he is risen indeed. Their conviction of the fact gives way to a celebration of faith. And in these uncertain days, what gives us certainty and confidence and comfort is not that we know the facts about Jesus, that he preached the kingdom, that he healed the sick, but he did this for us. My friends, profound facts on their own will leave us standing with sad faces. But when these facts give way to faith, that's when our hearts will burn within us. And our experience will be of grace, not Gaviscon. Not because we know that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, but because we know him present with us here and now. Not just because Jesus revealed himself to Cleopas and his friend, in their fear and confusion and disappointment. But in this bread and in this wine, he reveals himself to us today. We are part of a very new context. And church will be very different. But what hasn't changed is that at the centre of our worship is the drinking of this cup and the eating of this bread. 
For it is in these things that Christ comes to us again. My prayer for you this morning, especially as you're unable to share in this meal with us, that understanding it, that seeing it, and I hope sharing with us in this bread and this wine, your heart will burn and you will find faith and renewed hope as Jesus reveals himself to you and encourages faith. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. May God bless his word to our hearts. There's a lot more that we could say. Uh, I've said probably too much, but there's more that we could say. Have a look at that passage. Read it yourselves and um, pray uh, that you might be numbered with those two disciples and the others when they return to Jerusalem. And uh, yeah, their confession of fact turned into a celebration of faith. Well, we're going to declare our faith, the things that we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Great maker Lord, of heaven and earth, earth, of all that is, is seen, seen and unseen. unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, from God, God from God, God light from light. light. True God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified of the Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, heaven and is seated at the right hand. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so now we turn to our confession where we say sorry to God and receive his forgiveness. Perhaps a moment of quiet as we reflect. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have failed you, as did your first disciples. We ask you for mercy and your help. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins. Restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Lord. Who has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. And, and in our song we will praise our God. God says, I forgive you. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. 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 We sing our next song, which is As the Deer Pants.
You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. As we come to our uh, intercessions this morning, there will be a, a time of silence where you can bring to God your own concerns, those perhaps on your hearts, those situations uh, that uh, you want to pray for this morning. Uh, but we are in um, a time of <clears throat> uh, great challenge and for many distress, and it's right that um, we recognise the impact of the coronavirus on all of us. But we remember that it's love that unites us, and that when we pray, we pray with our neighbours and our friends. We pray in the darkest of moments, asking God to give us hope. We pray against coronavirus, not just in our own communities, but in communities around the world, where our sisters and brothers are living in poverty. We pray together for our neighbours recognising that it is our love for God and for each other and our neighbour that compels us to act and to serve as one. And so we pray and give thanks for all those health workers tending the seriously ill, for scientists working on a vaccination for all those researchers analysing data, patterns, for all those involved in the media, working to communicate reality, for all supermarket workers, for all those working to keep our environment, our streets clean, For all those who collect our rubbish. We thank God for good news stories of recovery and rejoice as we see hospital staff clapping and cheering as somebody else leaves the ward and goes home. We thank you for singing in our streets for the recognition that isolation doesn't need to mean loneliness. We thank you for notes through our letterbox offering help and support and for every act of kindness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the internet, for telephones and any technology that connects us. And most importantly, we thank you for that awakened appreciation of what is truly important. Lord, hear us. Lord, mercifully hear us. We pray for those who are unwell, those who are anxious and concerned for loved ones, for those who were already very anxious before coronavirus. We pray for those who have immune suppression, who are compromised, for those who are vulnerable because of underlying conditions, for those in the most at risk to coronavirus categories. We pray for those who are watching their entire income stream dry up, for those who have no choice but to go out to work and to be at risk, no matter how slight. We pray for those who are afraid to be at home and for those who are today more lonely than they have ever been. We pray for those who are bereaved and grieving. We pray, Father, be their healer, be their comfort, be their protection, be their strength, their shield and their provision. 
be their security, their safety and their close companion. Lord, hear us. Lord, mercifully hear us. Father, raise up your church to be well-washed hands and faithful feet, to be present to the pain, to respond with love in action, even if from a safe distance. Lord, hear us. We thank you, Father, for all those in our own community who are working to keep hope alive. We thank you for the Lindhurst response team and for other volunteers who are shopping, collecting prescriptions, looking in on neighbours, But now we come, Father, to pray for those on our own hearts, those from whom we are separated. And I encourage you now in this moment of quiet to pray for your families and your friends. Silently in your heart, hold them as we will be doing before God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And finally today, we pray especially for all medical workers around the world. Restoring and healing God, thank you for all those medical workers everywhere. For all those who embody sacrificial love in these challenging times. Those who put their welfare, the welfare of others before their own. Those who choose to stay away from their family and loved ones. Who comfort the concerned and the bereaved. Who reassure the anxious and the vulnerable. Working to heal and restore and love people who are ill into life. Be their guide, their strength, their wisdom and their hope. We pray that all those in authority will do right by all those who are working in our hospitals and our care homes. We thank you for those who have proper protective equipment But we pray that those who lack this will receive it soon. We pray that they may know that we appreciate their dedication and that when they return home exhausted and tearful and confused and angry, that we hold them in our hearts. So we pray for all medical workers around the world where resources and protective equipment are always in short supply. May these extraordinary times lead to deep and necessary changes in how our world and our communities work. 
May these extraordinary times, Heavenly Father, result in a genuine effort to address the profound injustices in life and that life itself being determined by geography. Father, awaken us all to the reality of how we connect, how we work together to create a community and a world that we want to be part of and in which you will delight. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing our next hymn. Which favor. <laughs> Yeah. 
I'm sure that Cleopas and uh, his buddy, as they returned to Jerusalem, um, took part in um, uh, a wonderful act of worship that is not recorded in the same way that the sermon that Jesus preached to them, probably the best sermon, surely the best sermon ever preached, uh, is not recorded either. Um, But we can imagine, can we not, that having had their eyes open to see and to declare that Jesus Christ is risen indeed, would have caused them to bless the Lord with all of their souls. We're going to share the words of the peace um, uh, at a safe distance, although we're okay, um, but uh, we're not going to do what we normally do, get up and walk around. We're just simply going to open our hands and declare the peace one to another. And as we do so, we share the peace with you. And uh, I encourage you, as an act of fellowship, even though you are on your own, so no one's going to think you're mad, right? Um, as you say the words of the peace, just open your hands and imagine in your mind's eye, in your heart, all those brothers and sisters that you know. And uh, I can't tell you how much we miss you and how we miss one another. Let's uh, declare the peace uh, with one another. Our story, yours and ours together, is a story of peace. Peace with God and peace with each other. In sharing our story, we share God's peace with joyfulness. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We come to our uh, time of sharing communion. And uh, as we come to share communion, we're going to... um, a new song um, and I think we'll use this as the weeks go on and hopefully very soon I look forward to singing it together um, the words are on the the sheet the hymn sheet that you got in your newsletter um, bread of life hope of the world so when we come to the distribution of the bread and the wine um, we'll play that song and you've got the words sing along um, it's rather beautiful um, from um, Bernadette Farrell you'll know that she writes the most serene um, melody lines um, that fit uh, her words beautifully so and we'll sing that um, a little uh, later on after we have um, arrived at that point where we share in the breaking of the bread together so the Lord is with us and with you His Spirit is with us and with you. With you we lift up our hearts. We We lift lift them to the Lord. With you we give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give thanks and praise to you, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, For he is our living word. Through him you've created all things from the beginning and formed us in your image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin. Giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross, 
you raised him from the dead and exalted right hand on high. Through him, you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. In the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and word hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is his story. This is our song, serving the Saviour all the day long. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. And on the night before he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This, this is, is our story. story. This, this is, is our song, praising, praising the Saviour all, all the day long. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, given for all of you. And Jesus gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup gave it and said, This is my blood shed for you all for the forgiveness of sins. As we do, so we invite you also to do this in remembrance of Jesus. This is our story. This is our song, praising the Saviour all the day long. And therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you and reigns with you in heaven to plead for us and all the world. This, this is, is our story. story. This, this is, is our, our song. song. Praising, Praising the Saviour Savior all the day, the day long. long. Except through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise, as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty. Renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in heaven and earth, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise, blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ is holy. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ is Lord. To the, the glory of God, God the Father. And so as we share in communion, I invite you to sing along. Listen, follow the words of this hymn, Bread of Life.
As you have heard familiar words, as you have witnessed the eating of this familiar bread and the drinking of this familiar wine, though none of this has touched your lips, I pray that the witness of a crucified and resurrected Christ to your own souls as ours would cause today your hearts to burn within you. We pray together. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life by the power of your Spirit Keep us always in your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If ever there was a hymn for that moment when Christ was revealed to the disciples there on the Emmaus Road, it is our final hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. This hymn expresses not just the fact of Christ's death, but our faith in what he has accomplished and won for us. And isn't it marvellous? Isn't it marvellous? Not that Christ died, but that he died for me, for us, for you. And isn't it marvellous, not just that Christ was raised from the dead, but that we are the beneficiaries of such a fact, for in his resurrection he has defeated sin and death 
and hell have given us hope of a life lived at peace with God and with joy in his presence. It is a fact that Jesus prayed that we, you and I, us, might be one. And I look forward with great anticipation for that time when we can share fellowship together, living that unity for which Christ came, for which Christ prayed, and which Christ won for us. So we sing our final hymn, <clears throat> I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. In the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me. there but actually it was enough wasn't it it was enough just to sing and to remind ourselves that facts are great facts are worthwhile but faith faith is wonderful faith is wonderful I pray that our gathering together this morning would have been a means of keeping your faith alive and your hope strong in a moment we're going to close with the words of the grace and we can try and experiment and this has not been done before we'll try it. so we're going to kind of do it like this we're going to have one open hand here so Ira's going to have a hand out there and we're going to hold our hands here 
And we're going to share the words of the grace together, extending our grace to you. Reach out your hand. So this is not an attempt by an American evangelist to get you to be healed. But just reach out your hand towards the screen. <laughs> and, and, and let's just share in the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. As far as we are able, my friends, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning, wherever you have uh, joined us from. We have a, a support group, we know, in Canada, if you're with us this morning, welcome. Janet, if you're in Spain watching us this morning, welcome. Uh, friends, we know we have um, all over the country and all over the world. It's been a joy for us actually to feel something of your presence. It's great for us to know that we are not alone. We have a wonderful, wonderful Saviour, and it's been our joy to worship him with you this morning. This evening at six o'clock, weather permitting, and I think it's going to be good, uh, I'll be sat in the garden um, uh, just uh, playing some hymns and some worship songs. And it was a great encouragement, actually, this uh, Thursday night as we were outside clapping um, and uh, celebrating our NHS and uh, carers and so on, uh, that neighbours um, enjoy sitting of a Sunday evening and listening. Uh, to those songs that we play. Well, um, join us if you can um, at six o'clock. My prayer is that the story that we have celebrated today, the story which the two on the road to Emmaus would have told probably for the rest of their lives, and thank God that Luke has recorded it for us so we can continue telling the story, that those of us who have faith in Christ are not those who stand around with sad faces, but our faith in Christ causes our hearts to burn within us. Put the gavis gone away, my friends, and rejoice in the presence of grace. We'll talk to you very soon, and God bless you today.